Interpol has identified 10,000 victims. It's a crucial milestone, but it's been described as the tip of the iceberg. What is the reality? Unfortunately, the, the uh, huge advantages around the, in, within this uh, information technology revolution that we're, we're experiencing um, means that the, the idea of having a sexual interest in children is hugely facilitated. So uh, part of that we see is the uh, proliferation, if you like, of child abuse material. I don't say that the internet is at fault here. Uh, human beings are at fault. Uh, it's a societal issue that children are, continue to be abused within our societies in every country in the world. We investigate via the victim to find the perpetrator, basically, and uh, to stop the abuse. We can talk about the number of identified victims that we have in the database, but we also should keep in mind the unidentified victims that we have. There are hundreds and thousands of unidentified victims out there floating around the internet. And do you have any examples to illustrate how exactly this works in uh, real life? We had a very uh, infamous case, if you like, with the Netherlands a few years ago, where, um, where the investigator working in the Netherlands said, this is a Netherlands case. Before anyone else spotted it, this Netherlands officer said that this is a Netherlands case. And, uh, you know, how can they say that? What is it within this image that tells them that this is a Netherlands case? In this case, the, the investigator was, was concentrating on, on, a, on a child's toy that was in the background. Point being that this toy is most likely a Netherlands toy. That, you know, nearly every child in, never, nearly every child in the Netherlands gets this toy as a, as, a, as a gift as a baby. That led subsequently to nearly 80 victims being identified. Uh, where uh, the person who was abusing these, this, this particular child was also abusing many other child, children. Online privacy has become a civil rights issue, but how can it be balanced with protecting vulnerable children? If we don't have access to uh, internet protocol addresses, if we don't have access to information that's held by uh, companies, by online companies, both, both uh, local internet service providers and also by some of the bigger global conglomerates who are now running the internet, if you like, the big, the big uh, companies. If we don't have access to that information, there's very little we can do. Uh, oftentimes when we have uh, a victim uh, identified as being a victim of child sexual abuse and we're looking at it uh, oftentimes unfortunately due to uh, privacy restrictions uh, we can find a case uh, fizzling out. And how far are private companies helping you to, to combat this child ex exploitation online? Um, I was reading that Microsoft uh, helped with some image uh, technology. Are there other companies, I can think of the major companies being Google and Facebook, maybe Skype even, um, how are they helping? All of these companies do it to a greater or lesser extent. They all, nobody again, nobody wants to be associated with it, but there is a certain breakdown at times between what they say and what they do. Would these be social media networks? Some, some companies. I, I, you see, you're going to ask me, um, I won't name companies, I absolutely won't name companies, but I will say to companies is that they do have a responsibility to these children. Now the internet is constantly evolving and this allows child abuse material to be exchanged more widely and freely than ever before. How does that affect your work? Any new service or any new software, any new platform coming online will be abused by people with a sexual interest in children. That is a reality. We see companies have no problem scanning for spam or malware and, and making sure that their, their platforms are not used for spam. They're not used for malware. However, when it comes to child abuse, they have some sort of a, they, do, they, they don't scan. They see privacy as being an issue or they see uh, First Amendment as being an issue. But this is child abuse we're talking about here. We're not talking about, you know, 18-year-old uh, girls in soft focus uh, looking out to the beach dreaming of future lovers. We're talking about child abuse. And in the vast majority of the material we deal with are prepubescent children some of them even pre-speech children. And that's the reality that we're dealing with. And one of the, the things I was surprised to see in the evolution of uh, how we're communicating with each other in the world is with live streaming. And you've mentioned any new thing is something that will be exploited yeah. by child abusers. How is that impacting your work? How can you combat live stream uh, child exploitation? Well, live streaming of child sexual abuse is, 
is an issue that we are dealing with on, a, on an everyday basis, both here and in our member countries. We talk about uh, people who have relative wealth in developed countries uh, are using the internet to reach into poorer regions of the world where they can then uh, basically get child abuse to order. Uh, they pay for it online and uh, the child will be abused on their direction. As um, technology and um, bandwidth increases in these countries, uh, we're going to see uh, a massive, it has the potential to being a very, very big issue. There's one particular case in the Philippines that comes to mind that was uncovered through uh, the ICSA database, um, which really, uh, you know, and it, it's, it's something I don't like everybody saying all the time, but I personally uh, found it to be probably one of the most upsetting cases that I've ever dealt with, and it involved uh, the abuse of an, a, a large number of children, all for money, uh, and it also included the death of a child. Unfortunately, this remote child sexual exploitation, because it's streamed, often leaves no evidence at the end of it, which creates another set of challenges in relation to the prosecution of people, uh, it, it, another set of challenges in relation to where it, it, it's streamed, it's then, it's, it's somehow nebulous and it's gone as soon as the, the connection is finished, the, the, the material is gone, the, the, it's as if it never happened to everybody except the child. Now you've been working in this area for a long time. What was it about this case that particularly shocked you? In this particular case, uh, the child sexual abuse was also accompanied by extreme violence uh, and by permanent uh, physical harm to the children. Uh, and so if you can imagine the videos, uh, listening to them, especially the soundtracks that goes with those videos, the screaming children, the, um, the permanent scarring to children, uh, that type of stuff is very, very hard to deal with. It's oftentimes, oftentimes it's not the images that cause the, um, that cause the reaction, but it, it can sometimes be the soundtrack, which is really the hardest thing to take. And it, um, it makes life, it makes this particular job very, very hard to do uh, at times, especially the feeling of helplessness, where you know that this child is being abused somewhere and being abused in this horrific way. You're looking at it perhaps not long after the event has taken place and you're, and you're helpless and you can't do anything about it. So that creates a certain level of frustration perhaps and it's that helplessness that drives the passion uh, of the investigators working in this area. Um, the fact that we can address that helplessness through very serious investigation by working together by working up every clue to do to its very uh, to its very end, uh, with a view to identifying these children and to stopping this abuse and to making people pay for for it, that's uh, that's what drives us on.